I'm going to sit today because I have things I want to think through as I speak. And usually when I stand, I have pretty well clear in mind not what I'm going to say, but at least what I am saying. And <laughs> <laughs> my problem today is I just hope I don't speak some nonsense because I'm going to sort of go out toward the edge of what I myself know. The question of <clears throat> right and wrong, of values, of what is good art and what is bad art, what is the need for art, these are very deep questions. Art basically is that aspect of human function, human uh, activity, you might say, which engages the chitta or feeling. But Einstein also said that the, the secret of, of uh, scientific discovery is also a sense of mystical awe. And it's true that in the higher reaches of all truth, intellectual as well as uh, emotional, there comes a calm feeling, a calm intellect. What I want to talk about is that aspect of uh, art that touches on these deeper realities. Everything in this world is, in a sense, relative. Einstein pointed out that there is one fixed thing, and that's light. The speed of light, however, is not absolute. It's a constant. That's a difference. The constant is 138, 130, 186 miles a second, or 300 kilometers a second. But they're already starting to think that there may be speeds, speeds faster than that. Master said that light in the astral world travels at 5 million miles a second. I don't know how he gets that. I just uh, accept what he says. But the truth is that what we really can deal with is not absolutes, but constants, and above all, constants in direction. In our age, we're faced with a great deal of confusion as to what is right and what is wrong, as to morals. They say there are no moral absolutes. Well, there are at least absolute directions. And the point I made this point in my book, Out of the Labyrinth, it's to me a very important book because it goes into the basis for all the confusion in our time because people think everything is relative and don't think that it's relative to anything, they have it going up, down, sideways, left, right, any direction. And uh, uh, as David Evey was saying, people say that it's a matter of taste as if taste had nothing to do with anything. But it does. And that's the point that I want to make. And I, because this is a weekend on the arts, and we've called them the joyful arts, for a very good reason, that art should take us in the direction of, well, obviously I've said joy, but why? We need to understand that everything relates back to the basics of how God created the universe and who we are. God created the universe, first of all, by, on the surface of his conscious, everything exists in consciousness. There is no uh, no possibility of anything being anything but conscious. I uh, made a joke yesterday of saying that I had spent the day trying to prove Master's thesis, or test it rather, that there is no such thing as unconsciousness. I admit I slept a lot. <laughs> I needed the rest yesterday. But the the reality of everything that we see around us and everything that we are is based on the consciousness of the divine manifesting the universe that we live in. It is vibration. It is Om. God, that one unmoving, the spirit, Brahman, that one unmoving consciousness in order to produce consciousness, as it says in the first book, or first chapter of Genesis, he, the spirit moved upon the waters. There was movement, and that movement created an appearance of duality. Daita. Everything in this world is duality. Again, duality is not a fixed thing. There's nothing fixed in the universe. Where you have vibration, you have up and down constant movement. And it's a very interesting thing 
that just as a playground swing, the swing goes this way, and as it reaches its apex, you might say, in one direction, already implicit in that position is its opposite. And in every one aspect of duality, there is already implicit in it the other aspect. And so you see that in the arts, there is always, for example, in happy songs, happy music, there's always implicit in it a certain sadness. And in sad music, there's always implicit in it a certain joy. These two are implicit in one another because they are part of the same one reality. People will say, yes, but when I'm suffering, I certainly don't like it. True. And yet, just think about the stories that you like to tell later. <laughs> Isn't it so? I remember I was at the, at the uh, in Carnegie Hall, was it? No, it was, uh, oh, blast. I know, I know it perfectly well, and you do. The, uh, where the symphonies are in New York. Where? What's the name? Lincoln, isn't it? Yeah. I was there, and Rafael Kubelik was directing a Smetana symphony. And I had bought a dictation machine that morning. And I, uh, they, uh, I, I've tried dictating. It just doesn't work. But anyway, I've tried it, and I had it. So he, the salesman spoke into it to see if it was working. It was working, so I took it. It was in a pocket there, and in the, just in a mo pause between two movements of this Smith and the Symphony, I thought, well, let me see if this dictation machine will record something at a distance like this. So I turned it up as high as it could to make sure that it would. <laughs> and then I pressed the button. I pressed the wrong button. The whole hall was filled with, hello, testing, one. <laughs> and the salesman had a very rough sort of materialistic voice. So help me, he got up to four before I could finally. <laughs> well, you know, moments of supreme embarrassment like that are usually things you like to sweep under the carpet. But even as this was happening, something in the back of my mind was saying, what a great story this will be. <laughs> and it's true that in everything, its opposite is already implied. And the duality of nature is, as I said, directional. There's a directional up, there's no supreme top. And the direction can't change the level of the ocean. Whatever the waves are, no matter how high they are, the ocean level, remains the same, which means that for every high wave, there has to be a corresponding trough. Everything in the end has to balance itself out. So this is a part of the reality that we live and that we need to understand if we don't want to know what art or anything in life is really all about. Then there are other aspects to it too. There is also the, in that direction, you have the three gunas. Tamoguna is the darkening quality which you might compare to the trough. Rajoguna is that movement which can go either downward or upward, but in, an, in, a, in a storm, let's say, you might call it the upward thrust of the wave, which then becomes a downward thrust. And finally, you have, and here I'm changing the metaphor around completely, and that's one of the beautiful things about philosophy, that... <laughs> You can't make an image that's perfect. For example, a high wave should be sattva, right? But, haha, -ha, the trouble with the high wave is that it's the farthest from the ocean. And that which expresses the inner self is that which is closest to the ocean. Therefore, we have to say that tamo, the tamoguna really is the crest of the wave. The thrust has come up from rajoguna, and in tamoguna you have the crashing of the wave, the uh, cresting and the turning into bubbles. And the low wave, same thing, but the middle. And a, a moderate, I don't, I meant the trough, but the, a moderate wave, that is sattva guna. Now then, we have these opposites, we have these opposite directions. We need to understand that the ideal is not to push the wave higher and higher. And many people, you find that in, in a great deal of modern music. There's always this, I have to make it more exciting, more pu push it higher, higher, higher. 
You cannot have any end to that except a crash. Impossible. There are certain realities that will never change. These are realities. Now, when it comes to the uh, individual, God created the little atom of ego. That little self which is in each of us, but we've come a long way to get up here. It is said that it's very difficult to reach human birth. I don't know where the difficulty is involved in as much as there's not much effort involved until you reach human birth, but you are pushed and it takes a long time. You know, in the Gita it speaks of God throwing this whole thing out with every day of Brahman, of Brahma. It's unbelievable when you think about the vast time. And indeed, well, I'll give you this horrible example of Buddha's explanation for why we should love everybody. Because at one time or another in the vast time span that we have been in outward manifestation, we have been close to everybody. Now that's pretty horrible, isn't it? When you think how long you've been coming. And you know, the odd thing is that every up has to be canceled by a down, which means that you can never have what you want as success. You can never have fulfillment. You can never have anything that you want. Because once you've got it, it's got to crash again. And the uh, sum total of all human effort has to be zero. Is it not ironic to think how hard, how long, and for how many lives people work to achieve fulfillment and the result has to be it cannot ever be anything but nothing? Do it all for nothing? And that's really what it is. There is nothing going on. It's all a show. Well, let's get back to the basics here. <laughs> the ego. All art <clears throat> has to express this basic self and the way we understand this basic self in the body. I went to the Joffrey Ballet once when I was visiting New York a few years ago. <clears throat> and I saw a dance in which some bright fellow had thought that creativity means always being creative. And whatever you do, you create from that. Whatever you do, you create from that and from that and from that. Which meant that in the dance, they never would, did this and then this. It was always this, this. It was intensely dissatisfying. There is something in human nature that wants to bring you back to your center. Just as there is something in the ocean that goes up and down, it needs to come back to the center. So all art has to come back to that. And anybody who thinks, well, he's got a bright idea and he wants to change it, will be doing something that is unnatural and against his own nature. So anytime you want to create art, first of all, try to get an idea of who you are and what you are. Everything needs to come back to a center. I don't know much about painting. I've done a little bit. And this is where I, uh, what I meant when I said I may be speaking garbage. I don't know, but I think that inasmuch as God is center everywhere, circumference nowhere, it seems to me that everything must begin at its center, and therefore I suspect that everything in art also has sort of a center of gravity, and whether it's in the center of the painting or not, it's got to have that focus. I'm a little out on a limb here. I don't mind anybody contradicting me. Because the basic principles of what I'm saying are valid and are eternal. Um, the, I remember I did this painting of the spiritual eye. And uh, it was sort of a, an inter interesting experience for me because I had a poem of my gurus, a prayer, which I wanted to give to the monks in SRF for Christmas. And I thought it would be lovely to have pictures in there. I knew nothing about how much it would cost to print colored pictures, so I just thought of several. There was a member in our Hollywood church who was German, and her daughter lived in Germany, and I'd seen some of her work, and I thought it was just beautiful. I thought that would be wonderful, so I asked this lady if she could write to her daughter and ask the daughter if she could do some illustrations for this, this book, <clears throat> which we sent her. Well, Finally, at the beginning of December, mind you, Christmas is December 5th. That's rather late in the game. This was back in September when I started the process. 
Beginning of September, I got these pictures. They were absolutely awful. The angels sitting on clouds playing the violin and, you know, just nothing that said anything at all and not at all the mood of that particular poem. So then there was a member of our church there who was a Disney, uh, Walt Disney artist. And I asked him if he could do something. And he gave me a sketch of what he had in mind and it just didn't do it. He didn't have the feeling of the poem. So I was meditating. I was really determined that this should happen. And I was sitting in my meditation room, and uh, suddenly this idea came to me. And I thought, well, let me give him an idea, and then he can make a painting out of it. So I went downtown and bought some watercolors. And I didn't know watercolor technique. I had done a little bit of oils when I was a child. So I did it sort of oil technique. but. Uh, I did it, and it didn't. It wasn't quite right, but uh, I changed it a little bit. I wanted sort of waves coming up to the spiritual eye, and it was just much too dark. So I painted little white lines, very fine, to make it an upward movement toward the spiritual eye, and uh, that was much too bright. So I covered that over with blue, thinking, "What'll I do now?" And it just looked perfect, <laughs> layered like this with sort of dark, sort of wave effect underneath and that brighter wave effect and then I don't know it was just wonderful then the spiritual eye I had a picture of master in front of you've all seen that picture and uh, I had him with his arms up and it was sort of the hands were like the spiritual eye and the arms also had that bit and the hair also had sort of a similar curve to it I don't know how but it was a very nice painting I decided I didn't need any help and uh, Again and again, I found that when I needed to do something, I didn't need to know the art of it. I needed to tune into it. And then it came, and it came quite nicely in music. You know, when I started writing music, yes, I had played the piano for hours on end as a child, so it's not as if I didn't know something about it. And I had studied singing, so that was no big problem. But I I did take a course in music composition, but by then... I had reached the point of being absolutely fed up with college. It wasn't giving me truth, it was giving me opinions. And so I just, I didn't go to class. That's not the best way to pass pass a test, uh, a a course. And in fact, I didn't, I flunked it. But uh, when I, it was an interesting story how I came to write music in uh, Yosemite, the beautiful park in California. I was there one Sunday, one uh, week, back in 1964. And uh, I saw a couple of young men sitting on the railing of a bridge playing with the guitar, not playing, not singing well, rather out of tune. And I felt in the mood to sing, and I can sing. So I said, would you like me to sing for you? Oh, yes, they were very relieved. (laughs) They'd wanted a little noise and couldn't... (laughs) And so I sang for them, and they said, oh, you've just got to come to our party tonight. We're we're having a group of people, and if you can sing for us, it'll be so wonderful. So I did, and people liked it and all that. And the next day I was leaving, and, you know, I had been put out of SRF, and I was really, I wanted to do something for Master which would not be a conflict with anything that they were doing. And uh, I thought, well... If people like to hear me sing, and I like to sing, wouldn't that be a wonderful way to share with them? And so I thought, what what had I sung? Well, I couldn't sing, I've been working on the railroad. I couldn't sing those college songs, drunk last night, drunk the night before, gonna get here every night like I never got drunk before. I couldn't do that kind of thing. <laughs> and I had studied classical singing, and uh, I knew quite a few songs in Italian and German and French and so on. But honestly, if you look at those, at those classical songs, they say the same stupid stuff. I loved her, and she left me, and she'd done me wrong. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't sing that. I thought, what am I going to sing? that will have any meaning for me. I could have sing, sung bhajans in Bengali and Hindi. That wouldn't mean much to American young people. I could have sung master's chants. But I wanted to draw them to spirituality 
singing chants would alienate them unless they were already interested in spirituality. And so I, as I was driving away from Yosemite, the thought occurred to me, well, maybe I could write my own songs. You know, it's interesting because all my life melodies have gone through my head and I've sort of thought, oh, that's very nice, and then let it go and forgotten about it. My first song, if you want to know, was written when I was at the age of six and I didn't write it, but I dreamed that there were these little ducks that came in sailor suits to my house <laughs> and they, they all were singing, it's time to go to school. <laughs> well, I can't say that was my uh, magnum opus, but I did have this thing in my mind. I've always felt melodies, I think, in terms of melody. And so as soon as this thought came to my mind, maybe I could write my own songs, suddenly a beautiful song came to my mind. And I stopped at a milkshake stand and wrote this thing down on the uh, paper napkin. And uh, my brother had left a guitar, a Martin guitar, which is a very good model, at my parents' home when I was, where I was staying at the time. And uh, so I got this guitar out and bought a book called Pete Singer's Guitar singer's guide, or guitar player's guide, whatever, folk, folk player, I don't know, some, you probably know it. Anyway, I wrote several songs, and I kind of liked them. The message was good, it said what I wanted to say. Somebody heard me singing and said, oh, would you give us a concert? And I said, sure. And then I thought, oh my God, I don't even know how to play the guitar. This was only a month after I'd taken up the instrument. So it really, uh, the reason I accepted was that I knew that at least it would make me practice, and boy, did it. I worked at that for a whole week, just all the time. And then finally the evening came, and it was a full hall, 200 people. They wanted to create uh, an atmosphere, so they turned all the lights out, and they had uh, one candle burning on the mantelpiece behind me. Well, if there was one thing I desperately needed to do was be able to see those strings. <laughs> but <laughs> somehow, um, I sang a few Indian bhajans. I sang some of my own songs and, and told stories. It, it was a success, and people liked it. And afterwards, somebody came to me and said, you know, I'm a music major at Cal State. And he said, those are some pretty interesting chords you had. <laughs> well, yeah, they, <laughs> I don't know about interesting, but... <laughs> Definitely unusual. <laughs> and uh, anyway, from then on, I, I uh, wrote, I've written four, over 400 pieces of music. And gradually, I, it took me time. I didn't know chords. I had only played what was written on, on the music sheet up, uh, for the piano. But I didn't know chording at all. But there are rules in these things. And this is the point I'm trying to get at. You don't need to learn the facts. All you need to do is discover what makes sense. And if you get this central truth of what you are, who you are, all these things work themselves out. The spine is comparable to the tonic note. Music should always come back to the tonic note. Do. La, 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 la. That should be the final note. It doesn't have to be, but it should be usually. I have that song in the piano sonata in the, in the third movement. Lord, I long to see thee. Lord, I long to see thee. Lord, I long to see thee. Lord, I long to see. That's not the tonic. You almost wanted to go thee, thee, right? But it doesn't do that, and so it demands that the piano come in and play everything else, and finally it does come back to that. But you aren't satisfied, just as I was not satisfied with that Joffrey ballet, when it just kept spinning on and on and on, and didn't come back to the center. In music, the center is that first note of the scale. And there are times when you don't want to do that, but it's got to be deliberate, it's got to be very conscious. A song that I wrote, it was an interesting thing. I'd taken many of the songs I've written were because I'd done slideshows. Um, I'd taken slides of different parts, and one of them was of the Mediterranean on the Amalfi Coast. And uh, there was one monastery there, and I wanted a song for that picture of the monastery. The 
normal picture of a monastery would be another thing. This was a place where tourists were invited. It was no longer a place where monks lived anymore. So I thought, well, I want a monastic sound, but it can't stay that way. It's got to be sort of touristy also. has to bring in more modern consciousness. So I tried the Gregorian chant. You've heard it here. Long I've called you, my Lord. Long I've called you. That's Gregorian in feel. Many years I have longed for your sight. Then it was time to break out of that. So, bathe the darkness with tears. See, that takes it out of that mold. You see how the mood changes. This is something that I discovered in writing music, that music is a language, and it expresses thoughts and expresses feelings. And anybody who just makes a pattern out of art is just not, pray, not doing art. It has to have, even as science has to have that sense of mystical awe, you have to have the feeling everything is not just a manifestation of consciousness, everything is an expression of consciousness. And the more you can understand that everything you do expresses consciousness in one way or another, even if it expresses confusion or doubt or, or uh, uh, uncertainty, all these things are expressed in movement, in everything that you do except if you're, like I was trying to be yesterday, unconscious, or the day before yesterday. But even then there's something that's always there. If you have... Okay, let's go back to yoga. The spine is the center. Everything begins at that center. You have the ira and the pingala. When you inhale, the breath comes up, and the en energy comes up through ira on the left side of the spine. <coughs> when you exhale, breath goes down in Pingala. And this is a universal experience that when you feel um, happy, you tend to inhale because the energy is coming up toward your head. That's a natural movement for it. And so you see something beautiful. <gasps> Isn't it so? You don't find people saying, <sighs> unless they don't like it. And you never find people <coughs> sighing and saying, oh, I'm so happy. And there are directions also, and it's universal. When you feel good, there's an upward movement. And you tend to look up, you tend to smile, you tend to... Uh, you, you, you use expressions like, I feel uplifted, I feel high, I feel exalted, or I feel low, I feel depressed, I feel downcast. These are universal things, and these must be taken into account when you create art. There are also universal symbols and... and uh, uh, for example, we are made in the image of God, it says in the Bible. Yogananda explained that this is a much more subtle and true thing than people realize, that the spiritual eye has a five-pointed star in the center. And if you stand with your arms out and your legs spread out, you find that you are a physical expression of the five-pointed star, with the head up above, two points and two points. And an interesting thing is that if you take that symbol and turn it upside down, as the communists do in China, it becomes a negative symbol. The swastika is a symbol. They've described it in different ways, but I think it has to do with the movement of Kundalini and how you're looking at Kundalini, because when Kundalini arises, it, it moves this way. But when you're looking at that same movement down, it goes in, a diff in the opposite direction. But the Nazis used the swastika which would be ordinarily a spiritual symbol, but the colors they used were dark colors. Black on white to emphasize the black, and then red around it. Those are dark colors. The colors you think of, you're naturally drawn to colors that are sort of expressive of who you are. The thought of the aura around your body is an actuality. And uh, the kind of aura that you emanate depends entirely on your state of consciousness. And so you will let, be naturally drawn to different colors. Some people are drawn to pink, others to blue, others to green. And uh, uh, each of these colors has its own particular impact on the body. A blend of all the colors is a good thing. But uh, dark and muddy colors indicate a dark and muddy consciousness. And a great deal of modern art 
If you think, what does it mean, you can't explain it. But you must know, some people say, well, I don't know much about art, but I know what I like, is not such an uh, invalid criterion as people think. Because what you really are saying is, I know what makes me feel uplifted or downcast. I told you yesterday or the day before about that, that hotel I was in in The Hague in Holland. I think it was there. It was some hotel in Holland. And by the reception desk, there was a modern painting, a large thing, covered the whole wall. It was just garish. It, it, it's, everything it said was, I'm confused. I don't believe in anything. I don't want anything. I hate everybody. This is, you call this art? Okay, there you can call it art. There is satanic art as well as divine art. And we must understand that this is so, because art can uplift you or it can take you down. Don't think that because a painting is famous, therefore it's a good thing to hang. Think, what is it doing for you? Because some paintings have a very depressing effect. And it may be a great artist and it may be worth millions of dollars, but I wouldn't want to go near it. I'd rather have something daubed that made me cheerful at least. So that's the next question. Why should I want to be cheerful? If there are no absolutes, why be cheerful? The answer to that was given us by Swami Shankaracharya, Adi Shankaracharya, the first one. He said that everybody in the world is looking for one thing, Satchidananda. That was his definition. You know, when Buddha came, Many Buddhists got the misinterpretation, misimpression of his teachings because he didn't talk about God. He wanted, he wanted people to think in terms of not, God, you do everything for me. After all, finally it comes down to what you do for yourself. Like one of the disciples of Yogananda was too light and joking all the time and so on. And so uh, Yogananda said to him, why aren't you more serious? Don't keep everybody rollicking all the time. It's, it's good to be, have fun and to joke sometimes, but not all the time. And this boy said, well, I know, sir, I'd like to change, but how can I do so without your blessings? Yogananda said, my blessings are there already. God's blessings are there. It's your blessings that are lacking. <laughs> we can't just wait for God to do it all. We've got to do everything we can. Granted, it isn't much compared to what we have to reach. But until you move in that direction, he can't help you. It is finally his work, his energy, his wisdom, his everything, his grace finally that does it. But you're not going to, if you have a cup and you turn it upside down, nobody's going to be able to fill it with a liquid. You have to make the effort to turn your cup right, upright. You have to make the effort to reach up, to look up. That's the whole story of the Bhagavad Gita. The war of Kurukshetra is not just a worldly battle. It also was that. It was a historic occasion. And, it was, and there are occasions when there is righteous war. If some country were to invade us, it would be right and spiritually right to protect ourselves, to defend ourselves. But the Gita was much deeper than that. That's why in the very first stanza, it sets the, whole, the tone for the whole Gita. It says, on the field, my children, the Kauravas and the Pandava children, what did they? Now, Dhritarashtra was the blind mind. Dhritarashtra, being blind, and that's been, the mind is blind. It can only see through the senses. It doesn't understand. Intellect is what says, oh, that's a horse. Mind doesn't know that. It just perceives the images. So it's blind. But he asks a Sanjaya, who represents introspection, to tell him what's, what about the war. And the interesting thing is that, you know, if, if you're, uh, let's say that you're in the kitchen having to cook and somebody else is watching a football game, you don't ask uh, what happened, you ask what's happening. The natural question to ask would be, what's happening? Who's winning? What Dhritarashtra asks is, who won? That is the key to the whole Gita. Introspection looks backward. It doesn't look at the moment. When you're involved in a great physical, mental, spiritual test, you're too involved to be able to think whether I'm winning or not. When somebody 
hits you, if you're fighting on the battlefield, let's say with swords and somebody hits you, you don't say, oh, why you do that to me? You get in there and do your best. It's only afterwards that you can sit back and think, well, did I do well or did I do badly? And that's what you have to do. There was a, a child in our school here at Ananda. He ran a race with, uh, in another, with other schools and somebody asked him afterwards, did you win? And he said, no, but I won against myself. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful answer. We can only beat ourselves, and that's what the Gita is all about, not beating other people down, but conquering yourself. And what have you got inside yourself? You've got tendencies of a mixed sort. You've got tendencies that want to rise and tendencies that want to sink. And art should help in that direction. It should help you to rise and not push you down. There is some art that makes you uh, want to rise and others that don't. You know that song that you heard that uh, Karen Gamow sang so beautifully, John Anderson, My Joe John. That's not my poem, it's uh, Robert Burns. And uh, I didn't know when I wrote it, but there are a number of, I knew that there, it had to be so, but there are in fact a number of melodies for that song. The most popular one, I think I have it right, I'm not quite sure. John Anderson, my Joe John, when we were first acquent, your locks were like the raven, your bonny brow was brent. But now your brow is bare, John, your locks are like the snow. But blessings on your frosty paw, John Anderson, my Joe. Don't you feel like, what a rotten life you've had and what a... <laughs> It just, it just says it, doesn't it? It goes up, but it comes down like this. John Anderson, my Joe. It's just minor also, it's sad. Well, I was sitting, I had done some writing of music, and I closed my computer down. I have a little keyboard there, which I use to write music with. I used, I've quit writing music. I felt that I've said everything I had to say, and I don't want to say any more. But I could. The thing is that, Afterwards, it was, I was sitting in my bedroom just getting ready to meditate when all of a sudden I thought of, because I was writing melodies for um, an album for uh, Celtic music w with uh, D Derek Bell. He's a famous harpist and he wanted me to do this. And uh, I was sitting there when I thought of that Scottish poem and I wanted Celtic music for Mystic Harp too. And I thought of that poem, and suddenly this beautiful melody came. And just look at the difference. See how melody can change your consciousness. John Anderson, my Joe John, when we were first acquaint, your locks were like the raven, your bonny brow was brent. But now your brow is bell, John, eh, your locks are like the snow. But blessings on your frosty paw, John Anderson, my Joe. So it comes down to the tonic, but do you see how uplifting it is? There's a feeling of gratitude in it. You can't do these things mathematically. You can't say, well, the rules say you should do it this way. You have to do it. Everything is an expression of consciousness. When you feel right, and this is how I felt toward that, those words, then it becomes uplifting. And if you feel that you've had a sad and a rotten life, it will be depressing. Like that that uh, I mentioned to you the other day, was it yesterday, about the song, Gloomy Sunday. The melody is, la, 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 la. I don't know the words, but la, 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 I'll end at all of the words there. <laughs> la 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 Gloomy Sunday. <laughs> and they had to ban that, sh that melody from the airwaves, from the radio, because too many people were committing suicide. Weak-minded fools. But nonetheless, music has an impact, and I think it should be just as illegal to put out music to the public that is destructive, which most modern music today is. I think it should be a law to write, but after all, people can only be what they are, so I'm not serious in saying that there should be a law. But 
it is an interesting thing that in an age in which we have a shift in values, we're moving from Kali to Bra uh, Dwapara Yoga, people don't know where they are, they don't know what's true, they don't know what's right, and they don't know what's wrong. And in this confusion, you notice it especially in the arts. There is just, I mean, Picasso, he, he at least had a sense of humor. But he had, his mo he, had a, he, he had his monkey create something, and then he put it up as one of his, and people were saying, oh, how wonderful, how wonderful. <laughs> then he admitted it was painted by his monkey. <laughs> but it, most art, I think, is, uh, frankly, I don't see any point in his art. These disjointed figures and so on, that it should bring you back to some harmony in yourself. This is trying to split your personality, trying to split your own being, trying to make you confused about everything. Yeah, he can do a good job about it. I mentioned yesterday this simple truth that if you want to get pressure from a hose, water pressure through a hose, you can turn it on at the faucet, which means more inspiration in my uh, analogy here, or you can squeeze the tip of the hose. And the more tightly you squeeze it, if there's pressure, the more uh, powerful that spray will be. And so, yeah, you can get energy, and everybody knows that art should express energy, and so they can't get energy except by squeezing their hearts and expressing anger and jealousy and hate and all these negative emotions. You find that, that modern music, modern art, all the arts, they just, they, they think they're giving you something worthwhile by squeezing their hearts, by not having any flow of love and joy. But we all want joy. This is what Shankara was saying. In answer to Buddha's statement, it isn't he that said it. Buddha never was an atheist. But his disciples, many of them became atheists because they thought that he said, because he wouldn't speak about God, they thought therefore he meant that he didn't believe in God. That wasn't what he said. He was trying to say, you have to do it, and so don't worry about what's done for you. You do your, first, first, your part first, the rest will take care of itself. This is the truth of it. But he, people were becoming atheists, and so Shankara, he said, yes, God is not a form, but he is a consciousness. He exists as Satchitananda, ever-existing, ever-conscious, ever-new bliss. This is what we all come from. You are, you, you are just, you're no different from God, except that you're a sleeping God. It's just that simple. You know, when somebody c accused Jesus Christ of being a uh, blasphemer for saying that he was one with God, he said, I and my Father are one. His answer was, Don't, uh, the, God says so and you better believe him or you go to hell. He doesn't say that. His answer is, this, don't the scriptures say that you are God? What's the difference? Most people are sleeping gods, that's all. They have this, the, they become this little ego, and gradually the ego has to begin to wake up and to realize that it's the same self in all selves. And so anything that you do that brings you towards such an ananda or bliss is going to be something that lifts your ego into higher awareness, which comes from raising the energy up the spine, not from lowering it, which comes from expanding your consciousness to include the consciousness of others. Therefore, art that is unkind, art that is brutal, art that is insensitive, can be good art, but it can be very unspiritual art. Spiritually, it can be a disease, and I think most art today needs to be called a disease because it's an infectious disease. You listen to it and it takes your mind away from what you yourself want. So I say if you have any works of paintings, for example, on your walls that are very well done but that don't express something that lifts you, burn them or sell them if you like, but I'd say burn them. <laughs> Sometimes I buy a book and I, I don't like that book at all. I don't want to give it away or sell it or anything. I'd rather not spread that disease. I, I throw it away. The thing that we need to do is look for that art that is, art, has, if it's true, will be kind. Art, you know, there's a beautiful thing in the life of Leonardo da Vinci. He enjoyed painting even ugly people. 
And you might think, well, that was terrible. But he saw beauty in that. He saw that in that ugliness, there is still that divine. If you have the, vo the vision of bliss, if you have joy in your heart, you don't look at the outward form. You look at the heart. And some people who are not beautiful outwardly are really beautiful. And other people who are beautiful physically are just sepulchers, just waiting to be buried. As Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. Some people are uh, sort of dead. Other, others are just sort of, I mean, they're already, their hearts aren't beating. Other people are dead, but just waiting for the undertaker to find out about it. <laughs> they're still, most people don't have any life in their eyes. Look at them. When you see people, worldly people, you can see in their eyes, they're sort of blo blobs of meat. One thing beautiful about people when they come onto the spiritual path is that their eyes become more beautiful, their voices become sweeter. I was saying to uh, Sri Kartikayan last evening, our singers have never been professional singers, but by practicing meditation, practicing yoga, they become, their voices become sweet. And one of the wonderful things that we've experienced here is that people will come for the first time and you can see in their eyes, in their faces, all the the tensions of the world and the worries and so on. And after just a few days, they become completely different. When you relax more, you become happier. The more you can relax into yourself, the more you find that you have what you want. Well, art should express what you want. Art should express bliss. Art should express joy and expansion and kindness, not because it's a matter of taste, but because art should reflect back to us what we want to be. Art should not make us more confused. It's easy to confuse people, but it should help to give us solutions. And that solution can only come, you can't say, ah, oh, so the solution is to paint upwards, right? You'll make a mess of it. You've got to have that consciousness. And when it comes, it just is amazing how, uh, Naturally, it comes. You don't have to work for it. When I wrote chords, I, I didn't know chords, but I knew that it had to be that. And Mozart could come and tell me, I don't think that chord is right. And I would have to say that it's right for what I'm trying to say. There's not a single note that I've ever written has not been written with my full sincerity. I don't know the rules. I know that it works, and I know that it lifts my consciousness. And... A gratifying thing for me is that many other people know it too. When you have that, for instance, a, a disharmony, you just know that it's, it's a, you stretch it a little bit, you want it. Life, if you're all just plain, it would be absolutely boring. You need a little excitement. You need a little stress, but you want it to be resolved. And sometimes, because I always, when I, when I ask God to... <clears throat> give me a melody. I have to have a clear idea in my mind what I want to say. I was talking about cloisters, for example. <clears throat> Let me go back to that. Long I've called you, my Lord, long I've called you. Many years I have longed for your sight. Bathe the darkness with tears. See, that's a modern sound. Takes it out of that mode. Of devotion. Then you need to repeat that to make the to make it clear that you mean that. Offered candles in prayer to your light. Now what would modern music do? How much longer, friend? You can't do that. It would, it would become emotional, and emotion and feeling, they're related, but they're, they're not. They're not the emo true feeling is intuitive. Emotion can take you outward into the senses and downward. And so I held it in. And I said, how much longer, friend, instead of friend, how much longer, friend, must I cry your name? I am yours, ever yours. Now, how does the song normally end? Will you come, right? But I didn't want it to end. I wanted it to go out into infinity. So the song ends, I am yours, ever yours, will you come? See, that's not the tonic. There are times when you want, but you must know what you're doing. 
You must do it deliberately, and when you do, it takes you out into infinity instead of, well, back here. There, t when you do it deliberately, then it can be right. But the point is that there are, there are realities, there are rules, and it's not as if you create them, you have to discover them. And I found that certain chords just worked, and other chords didn't say what I wanted to. Sometimes I've had David Miller arrange my music for me sometimes, and I've told him sometimes, no, that, that's not the right chord. And he says, well, what chord do you want? Well, I don't know music. So I say, well, come into my office where I have my keyboard, and I play the chord. I don't know what it is. And he'll say, oh, that's a G-sharp, seventh, whatever, or other. I don't know. But uh, it works. Uh, anything else didn't work. When you know, then that's it. And sometimes I found that I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't have any idea. It just seemed too much. When I did a slideshow, I called it Different words, it, Worlds. It was pictures I had taken of people in different parts of the world, different countries, different nationalities, different races. And uh, I showed the unanimity in all these different worlds when people are at certain levels of consciousness, they all show the same thing. That if their consciousness is down, they show it. And if it's up, they show it. And if they serve other people, they show it. And so I showed that in all these different worlds we live in, it's really a matter of how the gunas express through us, as the Bhagavad Gita puts it. When we have the right frame of mind, then <clears throat> automatically people express that thing. Now, I wanted a piece of music, and I didn't want it broken up because I had many short pieces, but basically the whole show was to show uh, universal truths that were for the whole thing, not just separate truths. And so I wanted a melody that expressed the human condition. It seemed absolutely impossible. Sadness, aspiration, longing, happiness, sorrow, despair, ambition, failure, all these things that people go through, you can't express them all individually, but something that would sort of encapsulate that. I didn't know what to do. It seemed like I'd never get that one. One day, I sat down at the piano and I put my fingers on the keyboard. <clears throat> and I said, God, give me a melody. And I didn't, I cooperated with what was coming and a melody came out. And I had a lady cooking in the kitchen up above. She said, that's perfect for a different world. Well, it was. Uh, would you play it? <clears throat> Tell me if this doesn't feel that way to you. Why don't you come up here where people can see you? <laughs> Humility's fine, and he has it, but come on. <laughs> we want to look at you. <clears throat> so this is the melody that came to me. And it was, it was not my conscious decision. It was given to me. All my melodies have been given to me, but this more strikingly than perhaps any other.
Thank you very much. <clears throat> Underlying all human life, there's a certain sadness. And so sad music appeals to us. There's this longing of the soul for its own home. And the joys of life are little reflections of that bliss that we're looking for. But you know, one, one wonderful thing was said by a French saint, Saint Jean Vianney. If you knew how much God loves you, you would die from joy. The fulfillment of all this seeking that we go through, and we go through so many stories, dramas for God knows how many incarnations, days perhaps, and days of Brahma, not just a few incarnations, wow. millions. Because it takes five to eight million lives to reach the human level, but then you, once you reach the human level, your capacity for getting into mischief is just about infinite. <laughs> <laughs> you can do all kinds of things and think that I'll find it this way and I'll find it this way and this find it this way. Everything you pick up and you think, oh, this is it, and it suddenly crumbles and turns to dust. Nothing that you ever have will be yours for very long. And very often in the very moment of fulfillment it disappears. We have to understand that basically there is, I mean, the dice are loaded. There's only one way out. You can only find what you're looking for in God. You won't find it in anything else. But there is this hunger of the heart that has painted image for, images for itself and thinks, oh, I'll find it in this girl, or that man. I'll find it in this beautiful place. I'll find it in this lovely situation. I'll find it with power. I'll find it with all the things people look for. Everything. You look at people at the end of life, you can pretty well see how they've lived. Are they happy? Not very many, and mostly those who are have settled for a mild compromise. I've always remembered what Howard Hughes said just a week before he died. He was the wealthiest man in the world. Somebody asked him, are you happy? And he, with a very bitter tone of voice, said, nah, I can't say I'm happy. All that money. Everything he could do didn't give him happiness. In fact, the more money you have, often the worse the, and trouble you're in. Because although you have all this money, you only have one body. You can't satisfy a million desires at once. So you get one and you don't have that one. You don't have those other 900,099. The richer you get, often the more frustrated you are. There's only one way out. And music should point us in that direction. Art should point us in that direction. And <clears throat> I wanted to do one more thing for you because I've spoken about melody as expressing aspiration. But there's much more to music than melody. There's chords, I've mentioned them, and rhythm, too. Lewis, come. Where is Lewis? I'd like to sing you a song that I wrote all on one note. And you might think, well, what kind of a melody is that? Just one note. But with rhythm, you'll find that it has an effect. Can you be heard? Yes, sir, I think you should be okay. <laughs> Peace gave us the mountains. Peace gave us the sky. Nightly when starlight enfolds us, peace is its lullaby. Amen. Amen. Peace gave us the morning, peace gave us the sun, bird songs that call us to welcome, day and fresh labors begun. Amen. Amen. Peace 
Peace gave us the seasons, peace gave us the rain. Cool clouds that gather to bless us, mist hands that soothe away pain. Amen. Amen. Peace gave us our heart's love. Peace gave us our smiles. Rays of thy presence within us, light that all strife reconciles. Amen. Amen. Sing Amen with me. You know, songs have their own life. They have their own reality. When I wrote that song, I intended to write a comical song. It had its own ideas. <laughs> it came out altogether differently. That's happened so, to me so many times. I don't write these things. I never sit down and say, well, let's see what kind of melody I want. I wanted to do this. Never. I have the consciousness. I think, what do I want to express? And when I have a clear mind, clearly in mind what consciousness I want to express, the, God gives me the melody. There's no work involved. Often it just comes like that. You don't have to work over things in art, perhaps more than anything else. But any real discovery, and I think anything that you do that's inspiring, at least to you, is a real discovery. It will come naturally. It will flow, as it were. But where from? We have three levels of consciousness. We have a subconscious, a conscious, and a superconscious. What we need to do is ask upward, and the answers come down from that superconscious. Subconscious things, stream of consciousness, writing, and so on, which is to me absolute bilge. Um, it doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't say anything, it doesn't do anything. Subconsciousness, you know, you don't get answers from the subconscious. You get them from your superconscious. When you tune in and ask your, you, this is the center of superconsciousness, but the heart has to be involved also. And when the heart's energy is turned upward, and then you ask here and receive here in the heart, you find that answers come to all sorts of problems. You know, I remember one time Master came into. Uh, his interview room, he was going to be talking with a group of us, and he'd just been cooking. He was a very good cook, but he cooked intuitively. He said, I never taste it, I just put my mind here and I can taste it here. And he was very blissful. I think there was more involved, but I, I don't know what, he wouldn't talk about it. He didn't talk about his experiences. Still, part of that bliss was that he had got the taste right. It was everything you do can be an art. Why is it that mother's cooking is always special? Because she cooks with love. And you go to a restaurant, I remember a restaurant in Calcutta that we used to go to, the Sky Room, and they made good food. And we wanted something Western sometimes because our palates were accustomed to Western food. And uh, I love Indian food, but too much sometimes can be a little too much. And so we went to the Sky Room. Sure, the food tasted good. Thank you. The food tasted good, but I always came away feeling heavy because the consciousness wasn't cooked right. There was a thing in the Reader's Digest years ago about a woman who uh, her, her bread was supposed to be good. She called it mad bread. Whenever she was angry, she would knead her bread with special energy. <laughs> Frankly, I don't think I'd want to eat that bread. <laughs> I think if you're insensitive, you can say, well, it tastes good, but there's something else with it. 
anything you do expresses your consciousness. Try to understand that when you walk, when you chat with people, when you sit, when you're doing nothing. Try to understand that everything you do expresses who you are and what you are, your consciousness. Try to be uplifted in your consciousness. This is what is so wonderful about having a community like Ananda, where people come to live for God and share in God, and when they are kind to each other and not always trying to tear people down. I've mentioned this story to some of you, but it was a very interesting thing. New York tends to be a rather harsh, often nasty city. There are wonderful people in New York, but that the overall consciousness, I remember I opened a door and somebody bashed into it passing by and I said, excuse me, and he said, look where you're going. Of course, it was his problem. I, I didn't. <laughs> but I remember I went to Stroudsburg, which is almost like a suburb of New York, although it's in Pennsylvania. And my hostess asked me to sing some of my songs for her guests. And they were having an outdoor sort of a picnic party afterwards. So I sang a song, and people sort of looked. <laughs> I thought, well, I don't want to impose my music. On the other hand, I don't want to be ungracious as a guest. She had asked me to sing. So I sang another one. <laughs> I sang a third, and then I said, well, let's go and have dinner. There was a stampede for the table. <laughs> <coughs> so I figured that, well, not everybody will like my music. It's not so surprising. People have different tastes. It didn't matter to me. But I was in the car with one of them. He was sort of the, you might say, the ringleader afterwards the next day. And so I just happened to ask him, how did you like my music? It was all right, I guess. In fact, I have a cassette of it, and I play it every day when I go to work. <laughs> I ask you. <laughs> Couldn't he say he loved it, for God's sake? <laughs> did he have to say, it's just all right, I guess? That consciousness of not daring to express your feelings unless they're negative for fear that somebody will stab you or mock you or make fun of you, that's a terrible state of consciousness. And that's something you don't find in this community. People are kind to each other. They help one another. You know, in any small community, there's always people always know what's going on with everybody else. But they're there to help and not to just gossip and tear down. I say this is the only sane way to live. And I think that the most important thing happening on the planet today, grazie, <laughs> thank you, Linda. She has the same last name as I, Walter, so we figure maybe we're relatives. <laughs> and uh, the <clears throat> I think that when, look at what Marxist communism did to instill communist concepts in Russia and China, they had to kill an estimated 100 million of their own people, not enemies, their own people, just to get everybody agreeing. And finally, the others in, others in terror agree. To get people to do what they want, they try to instill fear in them. Well, that works up to a certain point, but it works so much better when you can inspire hope and confidence and make them relax and do what they feel to do from inside instead of feeling that everything they do is a mistake or might be taken as one. In communities like this, we can set an example and are setting an example that is bringing people from all over the world because they say it's possible to live in harmony. What a wonderful way to live. I know that this community is already, already sharing the possibility of living happily and kindly with other people in the world. And I believe that this, more than anything else, is what can change the world. Politics won't do it. Wars won't do it. Governmental reforms won't do it. But people, if they can set an example and not just talk about things, then other people can decide whether they like it or not. And everybody wants such an under because we're made from that. And so everybody is going to say, well, I want to be that way myself how much nicer it is to be happy than to be unhappy. Some people hug their unhappiness to them, but there is something inside them that makes everybody long for that which sooner or later every one of us has to become. What Buddha became, what Krishna became, what Jesus Christ became, what Yogananda became, every one of us has to be like that. 
We are the same as they. We just haven't learned all the tricks yet. Haven't worked it all out yet. We're still asleep. We have to wake up. But there's no difference between you and the highest that ever was because you can't get higher than God and your goal is to become one with God. And do you know how old you are? As old as God. We should say you don't have any age at all. It's such an amazing thing to think that after all the countless incarnations, when you get out of it, you don't, you don't think about it. It just seems so, you know, at the end of a, of a new movie where everything has gone wrong and finally it comes right and you say, what a great story. I learned so much. That's how it is, only millions and millions of times more when you get out of Maya. So art, if it is to fulfill a divine mission, and everything on earth is a divine mission if people understand it, then it should be that which will help you to uplift your consciousness through color, through form, through melody, through harmony, through rhythm. All these things can be uplifting or degrading. Which do you choose? You're, you must always ask, who am I? And does it express this? And you'll be able to understand what good art is and bad art. Technique, well, that's secondary. But the consciousness behind it, will it help you? Help to make you wiser and calmer? Or will it make you agitated? Television today will hold a scene maybe two seconds, one second. That's because people's minds are so agitated. And so you want to be realistic and give them agitated art? We'll do it. They might even buy it. But it won't help the world, and it won't help you, and it won't help those people. Try to let your art be not just a manifestation of consciousness. It'll be that whether you want it to or not. Be an expression, a conscious expression of consciousness.